Welcome guys to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, the most Will Buchanan, and on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of limitations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of independence, we go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to actually get the in order, in order to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do and how the frack we got here. Thanks for listening and um, hold on. It's gonna be fun. All right, guys. Today's date, September 24, 2022, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, the most will be can on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense of it all. Uh, before we get started, guys, let you know that uh, we do try to watch your language on this podcast sometimes, and at times there may be things that might be shown that might be too intense for younger viewers, so viewer discretion is advised. Aside from that, welcome. All right, so where do we go to on this for this lovely weekend? I do mean a lovely weekend because winter is coming and I'm all for it. But anyway, that being said, guys, we do want to move on to two news as well. Um, as Again, Mississippi is back in the news. Uh, you know, if it's not the Jackson, Mississippi water issue that's been going on for decades, it's not the fact that Brett Farr is in hot water for using for him, the state of Mississippi, using welfare funds while the state is sending back rental assistance uh, money that can still be used by its residents. It seems more issues of, well, corruption uh, in legislation, which politicians are currently hot water in. I'm talking about this gentleman right here. Um, the former head, the former Department of Human Services, uh, Mr. John Davis there, has pleaded guilty to both federal and state conspiracy and theft charges in what officials call the largest embezzlement scheme in the state's history, according to the Department of Justice and the Hines District County Attorney. Now, you're probably wondering, but simple fact of the matter is, what is going on with this gentleman right here? Well, according to them that he did, uh, at Mr. Davis's directions, uh, the Department of Human Services for Mississippi provided federal funds to two nonprofit organizations and then directed said organizations to fraudulently award contracts to various entities and individuals for social services that were never provided. Again, he is pleading guilty to counts of cons- to 13 counts of conspiracy and fraud. And again, I can't help but say this. This is a growing, this is a continuing trend that we are seeing in states like this. I I'm not saying it doesn't happen in northern states. I'm not. But in the South, anybody that's there and tell you, you ever hear the phrase crooked as a politician? You ever hear the phrase, if you want to go rich, if you ever want to be rich, go to Capitol Hill? Unfortunately, that's the case in these areas. I mean, Mississippi, in Mississippi, in literally the span of two weeks, has had three major stories break out. One of one of their water infrastructure that is woefully needing repair, that black residents are suing as they should. I mean, not just black residents, but uh, Jackson Jackson representatives, which Jackson, Mississippi is about 80 percent black, um, is suing the state as they should be, because no telling how long this has actually been going on. This could be in the decades level. Um, Again, Brett Farr, uh, who is getting very little coverage, mind you. I mean, keep in mind. I'm not talking just major news areas, also ESPN as well, because remember Michael Vick and his dog fighting ring? ESPN couldn't let that go to save their lives about Michael Vick and his family, because that's the one thing that a lot of people don't seem to understand. Michael Vick was torturing animals. No, his family was. Was it being done on his property? Yes, but he wasn't torturing. He was torturing animals. It's the fact that he had family members doing it. But ESPN wouldn't let the story go. Or ESPN with Jameis Winston and crab legs. Jameis Winston, as a college student, stealing crab legs. ESPN would not let that story go as well. Brett Farr gets caught red-handed using welfare funds along with the state to build a new uh, facility for his daughter's volleyball team. Crickets. Utter crickets. Really shouldn't be surprised by that, but at the same time, it is literally crickets. Why am I pointing this out? Because the same thing is happening with this. It is amazing to me that in such a stricken area, because Mississippi is by far almost dead last in almost everything in the U.S., while its, while its legislation is corrupted and is literally, uh, is literally making money hand over fist, and at the same time, it's not being talked about a lot. 
That's the part that I don't get. Even in Tennessee, we just had a person who was also convicted of convicted of using uh, their position to to basically allocate funds. We had that happen in our state legislature. And it's amazingly the level of cricket that happened. The level of the, the, the deafening sound of crickets. Because we should be paying more attention. To this. I keep saying this all the time. Not everything has to be handled. Not everything has to be has to be watched and looked at at the federal level. A lot of this should be at your local and state governments. Because trust me, you can make it come up, especially if you're in a position to where um, you can't line your own pockets, but you'll be at the expense of others who could need it more. Because like I said, I just talked about this three weeks ago, that Governor Tate of Mississippi was sending back money that was allocated for rental and mortgage payment assistance for its residents. Because as we all know, everything has gone up but your paycheck. And right now, rent is due. Rent is due regardless if you have a job or not, if you can make the bills or not. We all know it. But Governor Tate insisted that the plan was done and to send back whatever leftover money back to the government, which that was, well, shouldn't have happened anyway. Because, yes, money was still needed by its many residents. But Brett Farr and the Department and, uh, Department of Human Services in Mississippi figure out a way to build a facility for a volleyball team because his daughter goes there. And all I'm saying is, why is this not being talked about enough? That celebrities and and celebrities and former professional players seem to have a leg up or a or a express way to getting things done, while those who do not have the same means are stuck with the ramifications for years. Again. Why is it not being talked about enough? That's all I'm saying. Switching gears for a second, guys, we do have some sad news because when it comes to law enforcement and people of color and the fact that law enforcement is murdering black people, unfortunately, it seems that police and accountability are still not seeing eye to eye. I'm feeling disappointed. I'm feeling let down. At the Hunt County Courthouse, sorrow and relief over a not guilty verdict in the shooting death of 31-year-old Jonathan Price. My client's been in jail for two years over a split-second decision he made in the line of duty. Former Wolf City police officer Sean Lucas was charged with murder two days after the shooting. It happened at a gas station in Wolf City nearly two years ago. Lucas responded to a disturbance call and says he thought Price was intoxicated and tried to detain it. Lucas used a stun gun, which wasn't fully effective. Defense attorneys say. I believe the evidence shows that he reached for the taser and grabbed the taser. Lucas pulled out his gun and shot Price, who later died. Texas Rangers said their preliminary investigation showed Price resisted in a non-threatening posture and that Lucas's actions, quote, were not objectionably reasonable. At trial, jurors saw body and surveillance camera videos. They also heard from the former officer himself. At the end of the day, the question is whether his actions were reasonable or not. And the mountain of of, of evidence showed that he was reasonable. But the family of Jonathan Price and their civil rights attorney disagree. They say the shooting wasn't justified. The verdict today makes every black citizen in Hunt County less safe. And it was delivered by a jury, not surprisingly, that didn't have a single black person on it. There was not one person that looked like me. There was not one person that looked like my father. There was not one person that looked like Lee Mary, period. They plan to ask the U.S. Justice Department to pursue criminal charges against Lucas because they say even though justice wasn't served, their fight isn't over. We can't be broken, and this ain't it. This ain't it. God will have the last say. In and that's sad. It is sad because this was a man that was literally outside where the officer says that he was belligerent, where the officer says that, you know, he thought he was drunk, used a taser on him, the man was unarmed, and yet the officer decided that, you know, I'm surprised they didn't use the old term, I fear for my life, took out his gun and shot the man four times. And, and as the lawyer sat there and said in that trial, it was an all-white jury. An all-white jury found the, found the law enforcement officer not guilty. As a black person, it's like, why you, it's like, why even have the trial? Because I'll be asking the same question. He's supposed to be, he's supposed to be, you know, when you're on trial, for all those that don't know, you're supposed to be judged by a jury of your peers. 
not a jury of your skin color. You know, an all a person person who's white on trial should never have an all white jury. I'll even argue the same thing. A person who's black should never have an all black jury. You do have to have a balanced jury. But if you're a white person who was an officer who shot a black person and you give the whole thing of, well, I, I thought I made the best decision at the time. I feared for my life. You know, the whole spill. White juries eat that shit up. At the same time, turn around to there and say, all right, not guilty. And they'll walk every time. And that's the thing that always bothers me. And this is the thing where I even have law enforcement officers come up and, you know, that see this podcast and go, well, you know, we, we do want to help. I said, you want to help? Get rid of those who are too scared to do the job. Number one, if you're too scared to do the job, you shouldn't be a law enforcement officer. Number two, you guys should be pointing out the bad apples. But we all know that you're not because if you point out the bad apples, you yourself are a target. We already know that from Jump Street. Number three, y'all should be advocating for more training. Because due to Biden and everyone else right now who is suddenly becoming pro-law enforcement, you're getting all the funding directed at you guys. And yet you guys are not clamoring um, for more training, for more uh, negotiation, for looking for special needs, for looking out for uh, disturbed behavior, things of that nature. It amazes me so that I had to tell the same officers like those things you guys are not asking for. But at the same time, you want people of color to trust you. This is the reason why we're going to keep running into this issue between law enforcement and people of color and why some people like myself still want to say F the police. Because, again, if a police can, if a policeman can kill a black man and get away with it, as we're seeing a disturbing trend for some time now, for some time now, I mean years. It's amazing to me that same group of people, the back, the blue and blue eyes matter and all that crap are sitting there saying, well, why can't y'all just trust law enforcement? Because they're too busy killing us and getting away with it. That's why. Even more so, the next story I have, where this is an ongoing one, where the story uh, back in 2020 that a uh, former Chicago police officer had shot into a car two years ago, killing the driver who was a black man and wounding the man's girlfriend. They just now, two years later, charged him with second-degree murder and voluntary manslaughter, in which that case is going to trial. The man that you see at the bottom... Um, if you guys remember, was a police officer that decided to shoot into a car for no reason, um, for no reason, thinking that, you know, it was it was harmed hostile. It was uh, armed hostiles in the car. It turned out not to be true. Um, the man right there, uh, Mr. Uh, Marcella Stinnett, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, um, was the actual victim that the officer killed. His girlfriend survived, saying that the officer act, the officer uh, really performed the wrong actions. And this is going to trial. So you can imagine, after we just watch what happened in the previous case, after we just watch what happened, do we expect the same outcome here? I mean, if he got a, I would sit there and say, if he got an all-white jury, I'd say yes. But it's getting harder and harder to see justice and accountability from police officers because it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, it just seems that with law enforcement officers, they get a pass when they're shooting at black people. Tell me if I'm wrong. But going on with going on for another thing, guys, moving forward to mortgages and rental assistance. Everything's going up in your paycheck. We did announce uh, this uh, this past uh, Wednesday that the feds are going to hike up the interest rate by another 0.75%. What does that mean for homeowners? Well, um, on one side, it's going to get a little bit harder. And if you're like me and say, well, I might get a fixer upper and try to do it the other way. Yeah. There's that too, but you're also going to run into another problem. Nothing as I expected. Purchasing my first home. Allison Braun bought her first home in February. After losing bidding wars and paying $75,000 over budget, she settled on a fixer-upper, expecting to save some money. It was really surprising getting in here and fixing things up. Overwhelming is another way I'd explain it. Rents are up a record 17% in the last year, with homes up nearly 20%, and so are construction costs. Braun, who works for the real estate company Redfin, is redoing nearly every space in her home. The kitchen needed new counters. And we were really surprised by the cost, especially the labor to put them in. We wanted to figure out a way of how we can do our countertops on our own and save cost and labor. So the concrete countertops were born. 
She saved $3,300 by doing them with her partner. She tried the same with her floors, but underestimated how much she would need and the rapidly rising costs of lumber. We didn't estimate enough wood for the first floor. Um, and we went back to buy more wood for the flooring. And it ended up that after a month's time, the flooring went up about 25 cents per square foot. But it's not just homeowners getting stuck with higher costs. Construction materials are up 24% in the last year. Bill McGrath's company is installing elevators in this new residential housing complex in New Jersey. So far, they've put in two. What are the materials in this elevator that you have seen an increase on? Well, right here you have the electronics, which this is a uh, stainless steel. You have the plastics, the electronic boards behind it. That's costing more. Uh, the ceilings, wood, you're standing on lumber, there's steel underneath. And is all of it going up? Yeah. Supply chain slowdowns and demand have pushed construction costs up, forcing projects to come in over budget and over deadline. How much more is this elevator going to cost than the one we just saw? We're at, right, this one here is going to cost 17% more material cost than the, the other two that we completed. And he says his 18-person company is spending more on gas to bring materials in, up 24% in the last month. All of these rising costs will get passed down. Where's the end? I guess the people that will be living here. For Braun, the higher costs means accepting things like painting the outside of the house gets put on hold. So we'd love to get hire somebody to do that. That's been put on the back burner now, and we're just going to have to learn to love the green. Now, Americans are... And that tells you a lot about where we are in the housing market right now. That, yes... Keep in mind, we just hiked up the interest rate another 0.75%. And it amazes me so that everything that we have going on is always price-wise. Lumber, steel, um, other uh, essential need, uh, essential items, electronic boards. Keep in mind, we just got past uh, building semiconductor, uh, semiconductor factories, um, which eventually will lead the strain. But it just goes back to what we've been saying. It's amazing because you would think for all the lumber, steel, electronics, that used to come, I mean, everything short of electronics used to come out of the U.S. Um, because we were a major exporter. We became a major importer. A lot of our steel came from overseas. A lot of our wood comes from across Canada. And trust me, those prices are going up. But it amazes me when they say, well, the cost, the cost that gets passed down to the homeowner. Here's the thing. I don't know why... No one won't say what needs to be said, that how do we get out of this? Easy. Pay the lowest. Pay, you know, if you stick with the people at the lowest end of the poll, because correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong, because history, history and economics have always said the same thing. When those on the lower end make more money, they spend more. When they spend more, the economy does better. That's it. That, that, the, the simple formula is inflation because what it is, is that how in the world can we still keep our profits, but still keep everything running smoothly? You can't. Because once you take away spending power from Americans, the economy suffers. That's the type of capitalism machine we're running on. That if, you're, that if your consumers aren't spending, everything slows down. That's when inflation occurs. There's not enough people. Because so you're telling me, William, that the reason inflation occurs is because not enough people are not buying enough products. Pretty much. Pretty much. And then on top of that, when you have a, a shortage supply, because we've seen that happen, toilet paper. Um, you've seen toilet paper. You've seen food. You've seen just, I mean, you've seen everything from food to electronic devices. PlayStation 5s and Xbox Series X should be get that giveaways. The price, the cost on phones going up, especially with that iPhone 14 that's come up, that literally phone prices are over a thousand dollars. Everything is going up because this is the response to a lack of spending. And again, the only way that's going to get better is to do simple things, increase the minimum wage. Pay people, uh, pay people market rate and above. You know why? Because we're basically asking those who are making profits 
to actually um, who actually or who are making profits, who are employing individuals, we're telling them, hey, you're going to have to pay more unless you want unless you want to go back to where profits and business was good instead of you worrying about how to keep your overhead down. Pay people. It's that simple. Moving right along, guys, again, um, we uh, the uh, excuse me, the January 6th commission is about to do its final hearing. And again, this is the things they are going to be emphasizing come next week. Reporter Catherine Falders joining me now. So, Catherine, we have seen a number of bombshells come out of the previous hearings with the promise of substantial footage, significant witness testimony. What should we expect next week as they wrap up? So, look, it's unclear right now if there will be any live witnesses specifically uh, at this next hearing. Uh, we expect this to be a recap of sorts in part, right? They will uh, take us through the day of January 6th again, uh, Trump's desire to go to the Capitol, for example. And we know that during the August recess, when the House was out for about a month, investigators worked behind the scenes. They interviewed additional witnesses in videotaped depositions, some of those being uh, cabinet secretaries in Trump's administration. We could see uh, some more of that. We could also see more sound bites and more clips, for example, from Trump's former White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. Uh, that's what we should expect at this point. You heard Thompson. Uh, he said to reporters uh, earlier this week that there should be uh, more video that will be shown. But the big questions here are, do they ask ultimately Trump? Do they invite Trump to speak with them under oath publicly? That's something they're discussing behind the scenes. We also know that they have negotiated terms of an interview behind closed doors with the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas with Ginny Thomas, who is exchanging text messages with people at the White House, who has communicated with state officials specifically on overturning the election in that particular state. Uh, that's something else to watch. We don't think that interview will happen before next week's hearing, so we probably won't see clips then. But after this hearing, uh, their work is winding down, but those are the big questions, the big outstanding questions. We also could see some sort of report about their findings in the next couple months as well. So, look, the committee has shown compelling evidence and testimony implicating President Trump in the attack on the Capitol. But so far, the Justice Department has not brought any charges against him. Why is that? And could we see that happen down the line? So the committee and the DOJ are obviously conducting investigations that are similar in nature, uh, but very separate in terms of the way they're conducting them. Now, we know uh, from DOJ uh, that they just two weeks ago issued another round of subpoenas to nearly 40 people in Trump's orbit, people who still work for him, former White House and campaign officials, top aides, for example. Their investigation is very much still in full swing here. They're still talking to lots of people close to them. There's still questions about his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, for example, who had provided text messages to the uh, Congressional Committee. So again, I think they're still very much in full swing here. When the Congressional investigation uh, essentially winds down and wraps up, we still will see a, a lot of investigating on the part of the Justice Department. I am sure. And of course, another story we're watching closely, the documents seized by the FBI at the former president's Florida home. So the judge has now laid out a timeline for the DOJ to get electronic copies of the materials not labeled classified by Monday. What's the latest there, Catherine? And so what the special master has... Okay. So of course, we went over the special master. They're just basically saying that they're going to review the documents. But I will give it to the January 6th commission that... Number one, this was brilliant. You did this. You you actually wanted to really investigate this because, as we've discovered, there was a lot, a lot of smoke there. Because, of course, when there's smoke, there's fire. So congrats on that. Yes, they're going to basically reinvestigate. Um, what's going to come out the end of this, what a lot of people are wondering? I think it's a planned attack. I did say this week that uh, New York Attorney General Letitia James has filed a civil lawsuit against Trump, uh, against Trump and his family uh, for basically falsifying their worth and real estate values to make themselves look richer in order to actually get more fun, to actually uh, get more uh, bank funding and higher limits on loans. So that's still out there. Keep in mind, Trump is fighting multiple lawsuits right now. Um, the false electors in Georgia um, literally dealing with Wall Street. Dealing with uh, dealing with New York, dealing with multiple individuals that are still suing him, and on top of that, 
he now has the DOJ on his ass about documents that he took that you know he shouldn't have taken but thought he could because he thought he could declassify it because no one told him as president you do not have the same powers as a dictator. He's got a lot. So, of course, the January 6th Commission, if they're going to do anything, um, they could bring up article con uh, cr uh, criminal, uh, criminal charge against Trump. But as we have seen, because I say this all the time, what is it going to take to finally put this man behind bars? And I think that's going to take, I, I hate to say it, it's going to probably take the kitchen sink. But I give the January 6th Commission credit because they want to run through the evidence because whatever they decide to do, which I think is going to wind up uh, filing charges, the DOJ is going to wind up filing charges, um, they have to make sure that their case is above reproach because how many times has Trump, you know, Trump has been impeached, not once, but twice. We cannot expect Republicans to do our, to do the job they're supposed to do and hold their party's uh, former failure in chief accountable. But... If the DOJ does move forward with charges, Trump's going to have a hell of a hard time defending his actions. But like I said, I think that's going to go on up happening. I think that, you know, the one thing that Trump loves to do best, litigate and lawyer and drag this out as much as humanly possible, I think will come back to haunt him personally. But again, if you have not watched any of the January 6th commissions, you really should, especially as a voter. Uh, I'm not saying this is going to turn conservatives because conservatives are going to conservative. Cons conservatives are going to do what they usually do. Conservatives, con conservatives are going to conservative. It's not really a word, but they're going to do what they always do. Vote red. Very few times conservatives voted blue. But again, as I've said before, many a times going into November midterm elections, Democrats are going to have a harder time trying to convince voters while conservatives are depending on those with amnesia to turn around and vote for them again while shooting themselves in the foot. Because the part of the current GOP party does not care about minorities or women, just old, rich white men. Prove me wrong. But speaking of conservatives, however, um, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy has finally came out with a plan. That's right. It only took nearly nine. It only took nearly over 12 to 13 months for the GOP to do anything but say no. But House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy has a plan for America. And yes, it's real. Control Washington. They control the House, the Senate, the White House. They control the committees. They control the agencies. It's their plan. But they have no plan to fix all the problems they created. So you know what? We've created a commitment to America. We're going to talk about it today. We want an economy that is strong. That means you can fill up your tank. You can buy the groceries. You have enough money left over to go to Disneyland and save for a future. That the paychecks grow, they no longer shrink. We have a plan for a nation that's safe. That means your community will be protected. Your law enforcement will be respected your criminals will be prosecuted. We believe in a future that's built on freedom, that your children come first. They're taught to dream big. And we believe in a check and balance that government should be accountable. No longer special interest. We should work for you, not the other way around like it is today. Now, for a lot of y'all are wondering, they've made a commitment. You know, that's why I'm glad. You know, I wish I was there because I'd be screaming, what's your plan? Details would be so helpful right now. Well, it's funny that's being mentioned about details, right? Because there's actually a website. And again, I'm not making this up. There's actually a website. That literally, commitment to America. That's right there, guys. Republicanleader.gov slash commitment. You can look it up right now. This is the Republican commitment to America. So you're thinking, oh, there must be a plan there, right? Let's find out. An economy that's strong. I'll just click on this to see what happens. An economy that's strong. Okay, there's got to be something here, right? There's got to be some plan. Make America energy dependent and reduce gas prices. 
Okay. And then, of course, they have the 60% shot up more than gas prices have shot up more than 60% of the current administration. Biden, 10 times the administration, Biden administration canceled leases, scourge oil prices. Electricity prices are up 20% since Biden took office. Okay, you're spouting facts, but wait. Show our plan to regain American independence. Maybe it's right here, guys. Maybe. Maximize production of reliable American-made energy, cutting the permitting process in time in half to reduce reliance on foreign countries, preventing rolling blackouts, and lower the cost of gas utilities. That's it. That's your plan. Maximize production of reliable American-made energy. You know what they're pretty much saying right here, guys? We want to drill more. And we want to drill in areas that we know we can't drill into, like forest areas, actually environmental preserved areas. More, They want to do more drilling in Alaska and offshore. All the things that the Biden administration prevented to prevent, to prevent ecological disasters. But that's what they're saying right there. And you would think, oh, okay, well... That's not saying any, that's saying something. No, it's not really saying anything. Check out a nation that's safe. Okay, maybe there's a plan. Do they agree with Biden and the fact that he's, you know, he wants to get more money to law enforcement? Are they believing the fact that we need to really change our laws and do our justice system? Are we going to decriminalize marijuana? Well, we want to reduce crime and protect public safety. But they mentioned defund the police efforts, which defund the police hasn't been said for almost, um, going on five or six months now just because it's not really doing it just because not a lot of people are backing it but again show our plan to control to and this is the whole thing about republicans their whole thing is controlling the border show our plan to regain control of the southern border fully fund effective border enforcement strategies infrastructure in other words build the wall keep building the wall and catch and release loopholes that again makes no sense Require proof of legal status to get a job. Again, that's already going on. Eliminate welfare incentives. Are you freaking kidding me? This is exactly what they have up here. I mean, we can keep going. A nation that's built on freedom. Already off the bat, guys, that this is what they have as far as plans go. It literally is just talking points. Talking points. And they call themselves a commitment. I can commit to losing weight all I want to, but as long as Wendy's is alive and well, I'm going to have an issue. The point I'm making out of all this is it is amazing how conservatives want to sit there and say now when they've had all this time. To, one major no, bank is now off. Quite you. So this is all this is reason why I'm saying that of all the time that the conservatives have had a moment to literally bring up a plan, they have a commitment. But you guys want to tell me I'm being too harsh on conservatives. I just literally read from a conservative website that House Minority, that House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy says, well, plan will save America. It will not save America. It's not designed to save America. It is literally just to be a pain in the ass. That's all I'm saying. But again, there's one thing I also do one point before we get to our feel-good segment, guys, that for the simple fact of the matter that mortgage payments and rent is almost is a dream in itself just to get, right? Well, Bank of America wants to change that. And again, I'm surprised that it's Bank of America. Offering no money down mortgages to some buyers designed to close the home ownership gap for minorities. But there are some important things to consider before you borrow. Rebecca Jarvis is back with more on that. Rebecca, good morning. Hi, Whit. Yeah, and one of the biggest obstacles to home ownership is saving up for that down payment, typically 20% of the home's price. Now Bank of America is launching a new program that will help buyers in predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhoods, including cities like Charlotte, Dallas, Detroit, Los Angeles, and Miami. It will make the dream of buying a home possible. And here's what you need to know. This morning, the cost of borrowing up again with the Fed hiking interest rates for the third time since June to combat historic inflation. We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a painless way to do that. There isn't. The result? New home loans are more expensive. The average 30-year fixed rate mortgage nearly doubling since January, now above 6%. The housing market doesn't do well in a rising interest rate environment. And that's because consumers are relying on mortgages in order to become a homeowner. And what we've seen since the start of this year is that millions of Americans have now been priced out of homeownership. As a result, more Americans are now turning to adjustable rate mortgages like the 5-1-R, 
which offers a 4.93% rate, more than a percentage point lower than the 30-year fixed. This type of mortgage lets you buy with lower payments for the first five years. The risk, the loans are subject to a variable rate, meaning if rates go much higher, you'll eventually have to make much higher payments, something that hurt a lot of homeowners in the Great Recession. The popularity of these loans is now at a 15-year high. Some banks are also offering new programs for those who fall within income requirements, like Chase's DreamMaker Mortgage, which lets qualified buyers make down payments as little as 3%, and Bank of America's Community Affordable Loan Solution, which offers zero down payments and zero closing costs in specific markets for qualified first-time home buyers. And the big disadvantage and risk to adjustable rate mortgages is what happens after the fixed period is up. This happened to a lot of people in the financial crisis when rates went up and they actually owed even more than they would have with a fixed rate mortgage. So you have to do the math here. Now with those zero down payment and lower down payment programs, you also have to remember that your monthly bills will likely be higher. And in a housing market, an economy like this, which is showing some signs of potential recession ahead. You want to be really clear about the risks that you are taking on. Guys, this is a very gigantic financial decision. Buying a home, probably the biggest financial decision of your life, and you want to go into it with the right information. Do all the math. You can ask, but there's also a ton of calculators online that will help you do this math, and they're very user-friendly these days. So do it so that you don't regret it down the line. So what it comes down to, guys, is the fact that, yes, banks are realizing that they're going to have a harder time um, getting individuals to get in homes. Because let's be honest, banks are looking at this differently than your standard hedge funds are. Because hedge funds people are really buying up land, building up apartments, because renters are nothing more than consider uh, constant streams of income. Versus homeowners, well, yes, homeowners can be put in the same player for about 10 to 20 years, or even 30 years. But after that, they pay up the house, they own it, all they have is property taxes. So banks are seeing this. And of course, their consumers, when to be homeowners, not, not eternal renters, are trying to offer plans. Bank of America, of all places, because I have an issue with Bank of America, is wanting to really target minorities uh, as far as for home ownership. Um, but as the journalist, but as the journalist said, please, 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 please do your research uh, before you get in before you get into these things. Because if you do not understand it, you could be in over your head paying more than what you usually do. But it's interesting to see now banks are actually paying attention to this and going, you know what, we probably need to do things differently. But as I said, with the Fed rate going up 0.75 percent. That might affect such things. But again, please, 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 please do your research. With that being said, guys, we're going to move on to our feel good segment because usually on how the fact we got here, we do cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom. Sometimes make you use of faith and humanity. But hey, it's the weekend. Hopefully it's nice and calm. Like I said, winter is coming, especially here in the South. But we do want to leave you guys with some good vibrations and things of that nature. Hopefully these couple stories will do that. This first story I did show uh, during the midweek review was about a man who is literally learning from history and showing others. It's good to be in Buffalo. You know, sometime between yesterday and this morning, I crossed over the 400-mile mark. Ken Johnston is a walking artist from Philadelphia, and he's walking to honor Harriet Tubman and others by retracing the walk to freedom on the Underground Railroad route. This journey is to commemorate the 200th uh, anniversary of Harriet Tubman's birthday. A journey he started in December 2019 in Maryland, a place Tubman traveled to rescue her brothers. It was supposed to be kind of a low-key walk, but then her story just kind of overwhelmed me. And uh, after completing the first 140 miles to Philadelphia, I wanted to keep going. And, um, and that's what she said. If you want to taste the freedom, just keep going. COVID put the brakes on the walk, but in 2021, he walked from Philly to New York City. And this year, on July 14th, he resumed the final leg. From um, Harlem, where there is a Harriet Tubman Memorial statue. This is Ken walking in Rochester. 
He made it to Buffalo with a clear sign on his back. He's going from New York to Canada. This was that end point of that corridor to freedom. Free black community that was here at that time during the 1850s when she would have been traveling through this area, uh, welcomed her and assisted her and her passengers. Welcome, the mural where we met, ironically painted by his brother. Tubman was often called Black Moses for leading people out of slavery. The famed abolitionist face will eventually be on $20 bills. History with a stamp right here in Buffalo. And Ken Johnston is soaking it all in and educating along the way. I hope to um, just continue telling the story of what it felt like for the soul of souls that came this way. What it felt like the sensory experience under their feet, um, however they travel here. His journey ends in an area where Tubman and others found freedom. Salem Baptist Church that Harriet Tubman attended in St. Catherine, Ontario. Claudine Ewing, Channel 2 News. Now, again, that's pretty cool, guys, from knowing from history and the fact this man is literally doing, literally walking history as we know it. And again, I just thought that was pretty cool because I keep on saying this all the time. I say at the end of my podcast, guys, um, to literally and figuratively, um, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. But if we learn from history, we're better for it. And I keep saying that. But the other story I got, guys, again, is just, it just, when you do good for others, it just, I mean, it's a, it's addictive. It's, it, it catches on. And what this man is trying to do as far as his mission and feeding the homeless, it definitely needs to be respected. Me too. In San Diego, Daniel Rocha is on a very important rescue mission. But instead of directly saving lives, he's saving food that would otherwise go to waste. I mean, there's a lot of food that they throw out. Bringing it back to the local Salvation Army to give to those in need. So many people are so appreciative of what we do. It actually makes it feel good. Daniel says he understands just how vital these food deliveries are. He used to be homeless himself. There were days where a hot dog was all I ate for a day. Dollar at that time was like $20, you know. Daniel turned his life around after enrolling in an innovative program funded by the Lucky Duck Foundation, aimed at tackling two growing countrywide problems, homelessness and food waste. The Salvation Army trains residents of its homeless shelter and then hires them to rescue food. So far, the one-of-a-kind program has saved a staggering 500,000 pounds of food, and all graduates are still employed and housed. That includes Emiliano Cerda. You know, I had uh, substance abuse issues. I had mental health issues. I was um, digging through trash cans, looking for food that way. He says all of that changed in just three years' time. I just fell in love with the position. What do you love about it? Helping others. I went through a, a bad spot right two months before I was here. And it actually lifted me up. It's a nice way of putting it. It lifted you up. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? When you're down, you can only go up. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News. And again, you got to love, you got to love when people find something that they're passionate about and it sticks with them. And it definitely did stick with me because, like I said, it doesn't matter where you actually, you know, make an impact as long as you make an impact. And that man is doing exactly that. So definitely want to give him his props. But that's going to do it for this podcast, guys. I do thank you all for watching, for liking, for letting people know. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, before I do get out of here, some shameless plugging as usual. I do want to shout out my buddy Vaughn, Big BZA dot uh, on all socials. Aiden Von Westman on Facebook. Definitely check him out, his podcast, his musics. Uh, his music samples that he puts out, as well as his uh, what is Big Beasy thinking on TikToks. Yes, they're a little weird, but sometimes funny. But definitely check him out. Aiden Von Westman on Facebook, Big Beasy dot on all socials. As for yours truly, guys, you can find me on all socials at Blockbox447. Like and follow me there. I usually post reviews of everything I watch and sometimes some gym stuff because I do a couple push-ups. At the same time, guys, I am all about, you know, moving forward as far as just being decent. I'm not asking you to be, you know, I'm not asking you to be goody goodies you know good samaritans all that crap i'm just asking to be decent we have went too far gone um being cooped up because of the pandemic that we can't you know say hi or say hello check up on your people check up on all your friends and family 
I know, Ab, make sure how they're doing because if you do a lot, because you just basically say hi or hello to somebody because we're all fighting something that nobody knows about. But by you checking up on them, seeing how they're doing, you're doing a lot more than just brighten up their day. You might be saving life in the process. At the same time, it takes zero energy to be nice. It takes 100% energy to be a dick. So simply don't be a dick. At the same time, guys, um, Corona and its Decepticons and monkeypox is still out there. You know, despite what Joe says, we are still in a uh, we are still in a pandemic. If you're going to be an area that has a lot of foot traffic, and I need a lot of foot traffic, uh, please wear a mask, protect yourself. If you feel sick, please stay home because when you protect yourself, you protect others, and that's what's going to get us through this because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. All right, so again, the track at the bottom, guys, I'm just going to make that just a wee bit bigger for you guys to follow. If you click and copy that bro, copy that link into your browser, we'll take you to my link tree. That's YouTube and Facebook groups for all of my podcasts. How the frack we got here, get bitten, of course, y'all from this podcast. Definitely like, share, and subscribe as I try to grow these podcasts into something bigger, as well as everything that we went over today. Let me know what you think. If you like it, you didn't like it, or you disagree, let's keep the conversation going. And if you're watching this on the replays, please comment if it's live. I still want to know what you guys think. The last thing I'll say about how the fact we got here, guys, it's all about staying informed. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. We are simply giving you all the information and allowing you to make up your own mind, but we provide a logical perspective that goes along with it. We do a lot better as society once we're informed. We're, uh, we're progressive. We move forward. We try to right the wrongs of our past by making decisions now that we should have done back then, like electing our first black woman to the Supreme Court, electing our first black woman to the Federal Board of Governors, electing our first black four-star military general to the armed services. All great things. When we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. That's why we keep asking ourselves, why does everything go up but our paycheck? Why do we keep electing different politicians but still the same old game in Congress? And most importantly, how the frack we got here. Thank you all for watching, guys. Take care of yourselves and each other. We will all get through this.